Number one. I had never been on the deep web. I thought the whole thing sort of sounded stupid. Some illicit part of the internet with unknown atrocities lurking in every corner. But I was working on my master's thesis in sociology, and I thought a paper on internet subcultures sounded interesting. I got together with a friend and he talked to me about Tor and showed me different precautions I could take to protect my identity and my computer while browsing on the deep web. I was ready to explore this bizarre hive I had heard so much about. Needless to say, for about two weeks I sifted through old websites that looked like they'd been developed during the 90s. Obscure internet relics floating out in the middle of nowhere. Derelict websites forgotten by time. Most of it was boring junk. Lots of Nazi conspiracy theorists, drug traffickers, pedophiles. It was what I expected. I would have been content to do my paper on Nazi subcultures on the deep web or maybe even pedophiles, but I ran across something that really interested me. It was a form awkwardly titled, Enthusiast of Suicide. The name led me to believe the form wasn't of English-speaking origin. The form itself had a multinational array of boards for users from different countries. I saw boards in Spanish, French, Turkish, Chinese, a vast array of boards, but there was one common theme. Everyone on the boards was fanatically obsessed with suicide. People on the English-speaking boards would share different ideas about suicide. How to execute it, how to lessen the pain for people who were afraid of suffering, stories about friends who had committed suicide, suicide fetishists sharing explicit pictures with one another, people having philosophical discussions about suicide. It didn't seem to stop. Then, on one of the boards, I noticed some of the people talking about something called The Suicide Show. It's on tonight, are you going to watch it? One would say. No, I can't, I have a big day tomorrow. I plan on going to work with my point thirty-eight and killing my boss, then I'm going to kill myself. The other would respond. I cringed at reading this. The suicide show. If it was what it sounded like, then it must be some sort of webcast with a bunch of people committing suicide? I felt my stomach turn and my palms were sweaty, but my mind was racing with curiosity. I had to find out what this show was all about. This suicide cult had already given me enough material for an exciting thesis, but this would be the holy grail. I found out that this show came on at one in my area, and I fished around until I found a link to the show. My throat had a huge knot sitting in it, and I know I must have been sweaty. But I couldn't let my nerves get in the way of my research. I was doing important work here, after all. The live feed came on with an eerie sounding midi in the background. The film quality was grainy, as if filmed using a cell phone or a cheap camera. A woman with a microphone held tightly in both hands stood there with a forced smile on her face. I could see her mascara run down her face as if she had been crying. She looked like she may be in her 40s, she was Asian, and she looked incredibly uncomfortable and afraid. I gripped the armrest of my chair, my nails digging into it. She made me uneasy. This whole thing made me feel uneasy but this was getting much more strange. She started speaking in a foreign language, so I quickly clicked the button that would display English subtitles on screen. Welcome to the Suicide Show. I'll be your host for this evening, she said, her pitch shaky and unnerved. Just the sound of her frightened voice made this so much more surreal and slightly nauseating. Let's start the show, she shouted with an uneasy and forced glee. She threw an arm up in the air, her teeth clenched tightly into a nervous smile and a tear rolling down from one eye. This had to be fake. It was weird, but there was no way I was honestly about to be privy to what I thought I was going to witness. 
they tried hard to convince me that this was some illicit game show from hell. That this woman was being held against her will like Vanna White at gunpoint. But I wasn't biting. There's no way this was really happening. Our first contestant is from New York. His name is Robert Howard. She read from the cue card nervously. Looking up at the camera with wild eyes, she then lowered the card. I could see her hand shaking, and the compulsory toothy smile flash again as she lifted a hand into the air. A spotlight highlighted the area around a man sitting in a chair. He had a shotgun in his hands. I felt my nails dig deeper into my armrest. I clenched my teeth and watched on in horror. He lifted the shotgun to his mouth. I saw tears running from his eyes and he fired. I could see the inside of his mouth light up for a brief second as a shot rang out, startlingly loud. I jerked in my chair from the sound of the blast. I saw his head jerk back briefly as a discharge of brain and blood hit the wall behind him. His head then lurched forward, his upper body slumped ahead, folding on itself, his head dangling. I could see the top of his head. I could see the blood and the gore, and I could see smoke wafting from the air the blast had penetrated. I had seen plenty of horror movies, and I'd seen plenty of gore on the internet to know the difference. I placed a hand on my mouth. I felt the air vacate my lungs as I stared on in abject terror. Judges, the woman cried out, throwing her arm as the cheap camera swung around to highlight three people sitting at the table. They wore black masks with zippers that formed smiles for mouths, and white tape that formed X's over their eyes with small punctures in them so that they could see the show. One judge held up a 3.8, the other a 4.0, and the last judge held up a 3.5. Our next contestant is Carlos Riviera of Los Angeles. She said, moving on to the next man. This man stood still, wearing no shirt and a simple pair of jeans. He was holding something in his right hand, and his head was hanging low. He looked like he was focusing, concentrating on something, trying to steal himself. He gritted his teeth, clenching them tightly, his body shaking and suddenly started to yell furiously as he brought a butcher knife up to his neck and started slicing it across his throat. The knife cut coarsely through his skin, ripping through flesh, but he didn't get across his entire throat before he fell to his knees and grabbed his gullet with his hands. I saw blood spurting all over the floor, gushing outward from the open wound. His eyes were lit up with fear as he choked on his own blood. Look at him gush, the woman cried out, her voice a mixture of false enthusiasm, panic, and something akin to disgust. He collapsed into a pile on the floor, his legs kicking as he struggled to breathe. Judges, the woman said again, the camera swinging around once more. The judges held up a 4.8, 4.9, and 4.7 respectively. There were two other contestants, but I couldn't watch any more. I closed the feed and walked over to my window. I had to catch my breath. My heart was racing. What had I just seen? I didn't sleep that night. I could see the man who'd slit his throat. I could see his eyes as he struggled to breathe through a throat full of his own blood. I could see his bloody hands clasping at his neck in a combination of instinct and regret. I could see him kicking on the floor, laying sideways in a pool of his own blood. Every time I closed my eyes, it's all I saw. Needless to say, I dropped the paper on the suicide enthusiast. Number two. So this is my story about how I made one of the biggest mistakes I've ever made.
going on the deep web. In every friend group, there are certain people who fill certain roles. The nerd, the annoying one, and the one that seems to hold the group together. I was always the quiet one, usually kept to myself within the group and stared at the floor during any social confrontations. I guess you could call me shy. Well, incredibly shy, actually. I would usually hang back while the other more confident people would tell stories and jokes. One day at lunch, another more social member of the group, Jason the Sicko, had taken the stage. He was going on about the usual shock videos he had found. One man, one ice pick, the Pan Olympics, you know, stuff like that. He started rambling on about this thing called the deep web. I'd heard the phrase come up a few times, but wasn't really sure what it was. I was used to him talking about the shock videos and trying to get me to watch it, but this time things seemed a bit different. He started talking about government leaks, hitmen, people being killed live for money, all kinds of crazy things. I couldn't believe it. Surely all this couldn't be real. It's probably just prosthetic makeup and all sorts of editing on fake websites to get money, I thought. I was sort of curious to go on it myself, but I usually make a point to not stray onto any websites that could be considered suspect. I asked Jason how all these people were able to get away with all these things they were supposedly doing. Jason told me that to access this deep web, I would need to download a browser called Tor and that it was completely anonymous. He also mentioned that I should disable all my scripts in Flash Player. He has always been a tech savvy guy, so I trusted him. It did make sense after all, the way he explained it. I finished off my day at school, preparing myself for all the possible things I might see later on when I got on the deep web. When I got home, the first thing I did was go straight to my room and take out my laptop. I was pretty stoked to see some of this stuff. After all, I've always been sort of interested in hidden government experiments and things like that. After a few hours of research and downloading, I was finally ready to go. I was finally ready to visit the deep web. Right as I was about to start my journey into this hellhole of the human mind, I got a knock at the door. It's my mother. She told me that dinner was ready and that I should eat it before it got cold. But I really did not want to wait on this after hours of preparing, so I told her I had a huge essay to write for school, otherwise she would think something was up, as it was not very common for me to miss dinner for no reason. Back to my laptop now. I had read in my research that the best way to search websites was through the hidden wiki, so that is the first place I visited. It wasn't exactly what I was hoping for. The links were all just random letters and numbers. Remembering what Jason said and knowing I was safe with Tor, I started clicking on random links, which was a huge mistake on my part. My brain would later never forgive me for the things I had seen. Everything sort of loaded at once, and it was not what I was expecting. This was not that hidden government stuff that I had been hoping for. This was truly disgusting. Images of child pornography, mutilated bodies, torture, violent religious cults, I I covered my mouth as my body uncontrollably heaved and I tried not to throw up. I could not bear it any longer. I had to get off this now. I started closing all the tabs I had so mindlessly opened all at once, each tab slowly bringing back the nausea that I was trying so hard to suppress. And that's when something odd happened. I had reached the last tab of my browser and it would not close. No matter how many times I clicked the X button, it wasn't working. A video opened up on my screen, and it was nothing too crazy at first. A man sitting in a dark room with the mask on, just staring at the camera. There was something so eerie and weird about him, though. 
His eyes were wide and bloodshot, and there was this weird symbol on his mask. It's something you'd have to witness for yourself to understand how terrifying it really was. And this is when things got worse. Immensely worse. The lights flickered on, revealing a young boy tied up in the corner, bleeding out by the looks of it, with a crowbar coated with blood lying on the floor next to him. I'd had enough. I slammed my power button down, my hands trembling at the sight of what I was seeing, but it would not turn off. No matter how many times I held it down or how hard I pressed, it would not turn off. The man got closer to the camera and flashed a quick grin, his teeth unkempt and rotting before walking over to the boy in the corner. At this point, I was fumbling around my room looking for a screwdriver or something to unscrew my laptop and take the battery out. I finally managed to find one and took one last look at my screen before turning it over to unscrew it. The man had written out numbers on the wall in the boy's blood. I took a quick screenshot and ripped out the battery with tremendous force, breathing heavily due to what I had just witnessed. I could barely move. My hands were trembling and I collapsed to the floor, hardly able to believe what I had just seen. Did that really just happen? It had to be fake, right? I thought to myself. I could not sleep that night. After all, how could I after everything that I had just witnessed? But, eventually, I drifted off and found myself waking up the next morning to my mom yelling at my dog to stop barking. Most likely the normal outburst directed at the other kids as they walked to school. I got up and saw my laptop battery on the floor, reminding me that all of that had indeed happened last night. What did the numbers that man had written out even mean? I hadn't really gotten a good look at them. Could they have been something like my mother's birthday? My birthday? The time he would show up to my house and kill me? Either way, I needed proof to show Jason that this had actually happened to me. In fear, I put back in my battery and turned my computer on, the thoughts of last night still plaguing my brain. I had found this screenshot I took last night when I heard a knock on my door, my mother reminding me it was time to leave for school. Maybe Jason would know what these numbers mean, I thought to myself. I took a picture of the screenshot on my phone and then left for school, each period of class feeling like it was longer than the one before until it was finally lunch. I described everything that happened last night to Jason and I showed him the picture, but when I did, his skin grew pale and his face was filled with horror. No matter what the numbers were, I had to know, what, what does it mean, tell me. He looked at me, dude, that's your IP address. Instantly, my heart sank, anger fueled towards Jason. But, but you said I was anonymous. I did everything you said and now some crazy killer has my IP address? It was then that it hit me. I had forgotten to disable scripts and flash player like he had told me to. I had been able to hold in the nausea before, but I no longer could. It wasn't long before I was in the bathroom at my school, hunched over, throwing up in the stalls, earning me a free pass home from the nurse. I pulled into the driveway. It was quieter than usual. And upon walking in, I found that my house had been raided. The man from the video had gone to my house while I was at school and destroyed everything. All our money was gone. All our valuables were gone, and our rooms were destroyed. In shock, I called my mother, and best I could with my heavy breathing and slurred words, told her that our house had been robbed. She must have sped home from work because not ten minutes later she pulled into the driveway, greeting me with a hard hug and tears. 
all our TVs were gone, my Xbox, my computer, everything. There was only one small sound left in the house, a faint dripping coming from my mother's closet. We made our way to the closet, each step feeling heavy as a brick. My jaw dropped and our faces went colorless as we opened the closet door. It was our dog, hanging from the closet ceiling, limbs butchered off and blood dripping from his throat, carved in his chest, the symbol from the man's mask. When the police arrived, they were trying to figure out any leads as to why somebody would do this and if we knew any possible suspects or what the symbol meant. I could never admit to them or my mother that this was all my fault. The man was never caught. My mother and I try not to talk about all this happening, but at night when I go to bed I still can see those wide, bloodshot eyes just staring at me. Number 3 I've always had a really sparked interest in what is commonly known as the deep web. And though the deep web has some good uses, it also has an incredibly dark side to it. The dark web is a small corner of the deep web, containing the stereotypical content, bulk drugs, child pornography, etc. That is what the deep web is notorious for. I took my first steps into this little excavation of mine into the darkest parts of anonymous sites to undermine the stereotype that the deep web is more a home to dark, illegal websites than anything good. Well, I came out of this with more than I could have expected, and now my view on humanity in general has forever been changed. The first site I visited was called Centrix. Centrix was one of the more well-known general markets, so to speak. A good example to compare it to would be Agoratha or Silk Road. Now, Centrix, from what I hoarded via lots of questions on the chat room over the course of a couple days, has been around for about 11 months and has been untouched by any means of being shut down. Which surprises me, because it has everything from Agortha or Silk Road, but to a much greater extent and a lot more variety. What some sites dedicate their wholesaling product to be, Centrix had subcategories for. Just a few brief examples. Snuff films, bulk drugs, all varieties, fake everything, IDs, licenses, you name it. I also met a guy in a chat room that was nice, as far as that goes for an active dark web user like himself. He verified some of the links I had collected and vaguely sent me in the direction of other sites for my personal use. This was a great help, and led me to my next site, which from the illegality and general morale of the site is what I consider the next layer or gate into the dark web. The site was called Brink Warehouse. Brink Warehouse was actually quite fascinating, not horrific to an extent, but had a different kind of dark backlash to it. Brink Warehouse, a virtual warehouse of textual guides, notes, leaked documents, torrented books, one that was even released online a day before it was published from quite a popular author. Now, at a summary this might seem alright, but take into account that the guides included things like how to make a drone-based homemade explosive, and how to kidnap adolescents in their sleep. Illegal leaked documents galore, anywhere from US classified cases to foreign affairs. Also included guides on illegal modifying weapons, joining terrorist groups, guides to scripting and nulling bank accounts, and so on and so forth. Not a fun sight. The next site I headed to is where it starts to get formally creepy. I got access to this site, which I consider to be the start of the darkest of the dark web, from someone named Francestern344, who was in a chat room on Chit Chat, a very common deep web chat room site that most of you probably already know about. Well, 
talk comes to talk and we end up on the topic of snuff films, how common they are, where they're usually filmed, and why, etc. I get his trust and we resume this chat in a private chat room that he had, which ended up costing 0.10 BTC for the private chat room. And keep in mind that only getting information was my main reason for chatting. I am not into snuff films, though they do fascinate me. We talked for a good 20 minutes before, without me even having to ask, he hooked me up with the site. We are just going to use a part of the site's all number URL to name it, so 5611 it is. Now, this site, 5611, required an invite extensive registration, questioning, and a one-on-one -on -one meeting with what I assumed was a site director slash admin. He or she was one harsh motherfucker, and the stern punishments for breaking the site's rules was laid out. The guy who invited me, Francestern344, I guess was a long timer on 5611, who had permission to let me take a tour of the site. Now, I did ask for a formal site name for future reference, aka so I didn't have to name it 5611, and he said that the site had no name and that it was purely based to display its content and moderate membership. The title, he said, would only make it easier to identify, which they did not want to happen. 5611 had a small membership that, he said, the runners of the site try to cater to very fondly as membership is 1.5 Bitcoin monthly, approximately $350. Upon entering the site, I had to check the Are You Older Than 18 box for the fifth time since I started getting signed up. Finally, I was in. The site's design was bland and blocky with a pure white background and very blocky close together writing. In the top right corner, there was the options to log out, add funds to my balance, and then a small wallet emoticon that displayed an empty Bitcoin wallet. But that was barely on my mind. My mind was on the center of the screen. In a single row down the center of the screen, single frames with captions and descriptions took up most of it. The top one had a still of a table with various blades and blunt weapons laid out. The title, 24-year-old female, sleeping, sug death, with a 2.25 bitcoin price tag along the side. A timer in green text was counting down, 11.51, 11.50, Under the timer, in the same green font, was 78 out of 100. A couple seconds later, the 78 turned into a 79. Realization hit me in the face like a bat. This was a paid snuff sight. With a shaky hand, I scrolled down through the seemingly endless screenshots and captions. One caught my eye. Quick watch, homeless, 0 0.22 Bitcoin, large view, low quality. It was like an attention-seeking YouTube title but it seemed to be working. And the eerie green font, 783 out of a thousand was displayed. A jaw-dropping number in my eyes. I decided this needed to be documented, so I did a quick transaction. Put .30 Bitcoin into my site wallet and clicked the arrow to enter. It took a minute or two to complete the transaction and after about a five minute buffer, I was in the showing. There was no chat box, only a slightly lighter border of gray and static. The same green timer was now in the bottom right of the screen. Three, two, one. The video begun revealing a city street. What seemed to be Arabic writing was on various shop signs and advertisements. Light from the street post gave a fuzzy glow to the scene. The cameraman, from the position of the camera, seemed to be leaning against a wall, the shot focused on a dinky red junker on the street's curb. From the side of the camera's view, a gloved finger points toward the entrance of a dark alley, where a man lays on his side. Like a breathing pile of rags, obviously homeless and alone, 
The finger makes a motion towards the car, and three men quietly exit the car and walk along the storefronts toward the sleeping homeless figure. The quality is totally shit, but the scene can still be made out and is enhancing by my horrid imagination about what is to come. About five meters from the homeless victim, the lanky group of thugs pull out plain white theater masks from their jackets, take out various small weapons, and pounce around the corner onto the innocent, unsuspecting victim. The camera picks up the quick shuffling of feet as the cameraman runs toward the scene, catching the thugs thrashing and stomping the man from his slumber. Cut him up, the cameraman's thickly accented voice commands the thugs, who begin to slash the victim at a wild speed like hyenas tearing into caught prey. Blood sprays onto the wall and onto the thugs' white masks. It is horrible. My stomach barely holds on. I can't take it. Logging off tour, I take a few more security measures and shut off my computer, taking deep breaths and sipping from a Coors Light. So, that was my experience on the dark web. I don't recommend anybody ever going on it. Do not let your curiosity get the best of you. <laughs>